right? We live um, right by Woodstock in the city. Of, oh. Yeah, it's like 95 degrees or something today. <laughs> You're not used to that. It's okay. You know, I'll take it over the winter any day. True, sure. true. I don't miss that at all. I grew up in Ohio where I used to shovel lots of lots of snow. It was where nuts. are you now? I've been living in Atlanta for over three decades. It's a lot nice down there. Atlanta's fun. It is. Things are getting back uh, to business, as I'm sure they are in your neck of the woods. Yep, for sure. Went from an empty calendar to a full calendar in a matter of days. Wow. Yeah. So you got a full uh, schedule, I'm sure. It's it's probably been really not so great uh, the last uh, 15 or so months. We made the best of it, really. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, it was not the worst 15 months of my life. And that's the thing, you just have time to recuperate and to really recharge the batteries. I'm sure the creative ones as well. 100%, yes. I mean, I think sometimes you don't even realize how tired and burnt out you are until you have a chance to just slow down and reflect and be calm and still for a moment. That's so true. So your third album is out. Uh, that must be incredibly exciting and a good feeling of accomplishment. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like I finally birthed something that I've been carrying around for a few years. So it took a few years. I mean, from, from start to finish, how long from writing until the final release? I mean, um, we recorded it in January of 2020. So, uh, you know, with the intent of releasing it in 2020. Um, so, I mean, even just from recording to now, it's been almost a year and a half and, you know, we were writing for about two years before that. So it's been like, wow. you know, three or four years in the making at this point. Wow. That is a while. That, that really is. And, and to really put it on hold like that, just like they did, like with the James Bond movie, just like, when's this thing coming out? It's like, but it's, it's worth the way it, it totally is. Yes. Absolutely. I'm happy now we can actually play shows and have it in person to give people. Yeah, so this is an 11... Yeah, release party on Saturday. Oh, cool. What'd you say? Where, where's your uh, release party at? We had it in Woodstock. Oh, thanks. And uh, it was great, great fun, and everybody was really excited to be out, and it just was kind of a, a, a magical evening. Yeah, great collection of songs, carrying on the rockabilly spirit. It's just got so much energy. Thank you. Absolutely. So it starts with the song Let's Go. I mean, what was the, what was the origin of that? Well, without uh, throwing anybody specific under the bus, <laughs> this song, uh, unlike my normal writing style, which is very positive and you know usually has like an optimistic spin uh this one is kind of about a person who was really supposed to help my life and help my career and um to kind of put all my eggs in in this basket with with one basket with this person and um they really let, like kind of let me down and ended up making things harder instead of easier uh and this and you know i felt just like so frustrated and so stifled and, and this was sort of like my therapy release to write this song and, and like process getting through that and just like keep to keep going. Like, let's go is about just, you know, I'm not going to let this halter me or stop me. I need to like push through this, this barrier and this frustration and, and, you know, overcome this issue. No, a great way to start off the album. It's like, you got to have that energy and get people roped in, uh, to, to the whole collection. So the title track, Here to Tell the Tale, uh, there's a little story behind that. Uh, it, it involves an injury from a few years ago. Uh, what, what's that f a story behind your injury? <sighs> well, to make a long story short, I got drunk and fell down the stairs while on tour <laughs> in California. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we were on the road and that really happened. It was like a very bad break. Um, 
like I shattered my ankle and the lower part of my leg and we had a I know a whole a bunch more West Coast shows and then we were supposed to do a number of shows to uh, head back from the West Coast to the East Coast. So needless to say, we had to cancel the rest of the tour and I had to fly home and get emergency surgery. And um, I mean, it's been two years and I'm still recuperating, um, but we were out playing gigs again, I think two or three weeks after my surgery, I would just bring this chair that looked like a high a zebra striped high heel and i would bring it onto stage and i'd hobble on the stage and i would sit down and we would we brought that chair all over the northeast and just uh you know played as much as we could despite the uh the setback that's a real survivor story so how's it going now with uh you know physical therapy and things like that yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. Like I did it for a while afterwards. It just, um, I'll never be the same again. I mean, I have 17 screws or maybe, maybe 20, like 20 screws and three metal plates in my leg. Actually I have, I think I have the x-rays. Cool. Somewhere right, right in front of <laughs> I'm into me. orthopedics. It's... <laughs> They're pretty crazy looking. Um, so I'm going to have just like a ton of, of hardware in my leg forever. Um, but you know, as I said, it's been two years and I feel like yeah. I'm still seeing, I'm still recuperating, uh -huh. um, you know, uh, every, every six months, I feel like, oh wait, like it's still getting a little bit better. Um, so, you know, there's, there's hope, but I'm able to, to hike and walk my dogs and, and do. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. If you see this, uh, x-ray, you could see like all of this hardware. And the ankle. So it's just obviously just that one that you would, how did you, how did you, you just, one leg. So you just fell on that leg and just like, bam. I just tumbled. It, it was kind of like a curvy staircase. And I just, you know, from the top, I, I remember I was excited about finding peanut butter cups in the cabinet. <laughs> and I was, I had chocolate in my hands and I was running down the stairs to give them to my husband, who's my bass player. Uh -huh. And, uh, I think when they carried me out to the car, I still had the butter, the chocolate peanut butter cup in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, you got a full album yeah. out of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's just one of the things like that, that Hear the Tell the Tale is about. But I mean, in general, it's just about not living, you know, behind a computer or behind a cell phone and just about really getting out and having your own first-hand experiences, which are not all going to be good, but like, hey, the bad experiences help build character and, you know, make for it being an interesting person. So it's, you know, about having experiences so that you have your own unique tale to tell um, totally. as opposed to, you know, living vicariously through other people or through movies or TV or whatever. Yeah, oh, how true that is. So you mentioned your husband, bassist, Matt. How is he doing it? Yeah. <laughs> so he must be assisting a lot too. I mean, like to, to get through everything, especially with your injury. I mean, I'm sure he was a huge help. Oh yeah, for sure. He, he was great. He did a lot of cooking for me, a lot of walking the dogs back then. Um, but you know, we're, we're used to being together all the time. We've, we met touring together in our old separate bands and we've just always been on the road together, spent a lot of time together and played music um, as a team. We also play as a duo called the Gold Hope Duo. So when we're not doing full band stuff, we're touring or recording, we're playing as a duo. So how did that all come together when uh, you were in your separate bands? You were in one, he's in the other. Uh, and were you just like, were you uh, touring with each other and that's how you got to know each other and then you just combined uh, when your I bands were yeah. folding? We met um, we met when our old bands got put on bills together. Just and yeah. Matt was actually living down in Brooklyn at the time, and I was living where we live now. But he's originally from here, so he'd come upstate with his band. Um, he had a psycho Billy band called the Arkhams, and they'd come upstate. And um, I was playing in two bands at the time: uh, a more traditional rockabilly band called Lyra Hope and the Champ Tones, and also I was playing in like a punk rock power trio called Tiger Piss. Um, and both of those bands would end up getting put on bills with Matt's band, the Arkham. So we met that way. And then we ended up going on a tour together called the Coney Island Rock and Roll Roadshow. That was his band, my band. There was a sideshow performer and a, 
and um, a burlesque dancer and an MC. And so we spent a few weeks on the road together um, with our, our separate bands and kind of really got to know each other that way. And then, you know, one thing went to another, we started hanging out more and then started playing music together. That is so cool. So <clears throat> do you have a home studio? Do you make music uh, when you're together at home or is that just like totally completely separate? And it's like, you know, music's uh, in the studio or on the road and home is home. Well, we just um, moved into our house um, right as the pandemic hit. We, we closed on our home on March 11th of 2020. So literally oh, as the world was closing gosh. down around us. Um, so we had a lot of time to really settle in here. I mean, we didn't leave the house for months, basically. The first few months we, we got this house. So this is the first time we've had a home studio since last year. Um, and we, we've done some recording. We actually um, wrote and recorded a pandemic EP as a duo called Songs in the Key of Quarantine that we released last summer. Oh, cool. So you're always creating. I mean, that, you seem to find the creative spirit when you're in lockdown. So that that's uh, really excellent, I'm sure. Well, I had a lot of time then. Yeah, totally. So this is your third album, uh, Here to Tell the Tale. Uh, you have some other really interesting tracks on there, too, that are a little bit more mellow, like It's a Crime. What's the story behind It's a Crime, and how did, how did that come to fruition? I mean, you know, as, as I think I mentioned, like there is a little bit of, of a running theme throughout the album, um, sort of like I talked about here to tell the tale about, you know, getting out and having your own tale to tell. And it's a crime definitely ties in with that. Um, but on the, uh, coming from the, the angle of if you don't give yourself the opportunity to experience all of these things, you know, quote, it's a crime, you're, you're robbing yourself of, of living That's your life. Um, so yeah, that's really, it wasn't necessarily about a specific person, just as a generalization. Yeah, it kind of mellows on around that point. And you have another great track with uh, the voicemails from your mother. <laughs> I love this about, about having advice. And it's just like, you know, like I'm not asking, you know, I'm not asking for this advice, but we're just getting this unsolicited advice. That's a very good track, some advice. So how was that like trying to get all Thank those? You. That one's become kind of a crowd. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that's become a crowd favorite, and everybody sings along. They do, we try to get the people to shout some advice with us, and that that yeah, was my mom on the album actually recording. And at our album release party this past weekend, she came up on stage with us and did those parts. Uh, you know, I grew up on Long Island with a very kind of overbearing, advice giving <laughs> woman, and it's never changed even as a married adult. Um, with my own life and career, it's still, you know, constant, constant unsolicited advice. So <laughs> I had written a song in the past few years. I had written one for my grandfather and I had written one for my grandmother. And I just, I kind of felt like it was her turn. And uh, that was the thing that is really the most prevalent in our relationship. <laughs> I mean, and it's like, I'm not asking for this advice. And of course, a New York mother, I mean, yeah, it's probably happens every other second, I'm sure. What was life like? What was life like uh, just growing up on Long Island? And uh, how did you get into music? Um, life on Long Island, it was not very exciting, honestly. It was, you know, <laughs> it was, I grew up in like a pretty just safe suburban community. Uh, I got started in music doing community theater with my mom, doing musical theater. Um, so I guess, you know, that was one of the more fun things that, that we did there. It's a great place if you love, like, shopping and religion. You know, there's a million synagogues and churches and strip, strip malls. That's what there is. Um, <laughs> which my mom likes those things, so it's, it's good for her. But, yeah, community theater, singing there, you know, singing in school and choir, and my mom... She used to play guitar, so she got me started playing guitar at around age nine. Cool. Did you take lessons or just basically play by ear? Well, I, I didn't take a ton of lessons. I took like a handful of lessons when I was first learning. And then um, and then I took a few lessons in college, but most of the, that was in between years for just self-taught. 
So being on Long Island, uh, there's no way you can get away from somebody named Billy Joel. <laughs> has, has he influenced you at all uh, on the island? I mean, I'm a, I'm a Billy Joel fan. I respect yeah. Billy Joel. I'm not like a huge fanatic or anything. And, you know, like surprisingly, he, he wasn't, you know, brought up all that much. You know, you sometimes hear like, oh, there's a lot of famous people from Long Island, you know, Billy Joel. And more important to my life at this point is Brian Setzer is from Massapequa, um, which is like 15 minutes away from where I grew up. So there's like that kind of rockabilly ties. Yeah, I could hear that a lot in the, in the music, definitely. Lots of Stray Cats uh, influence. So when did you first discover the Stray Cats? Well, my husband has a great story. He remembers his mom getting him a Stray Cats cassette tape when he was like 10 or so because his mom liked the Stray Cats. So he knew about them since he was like very, very young. I probably, you know, I, I didn't. My, my parents weren't quite that cool. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't remember when I started. Uh, probably in my 20s is really when I, when I like delved into the roots music scene more. And you have a keyboardist on the album, Matt Jordan, who has ties, I believe. Uh, how did that come about? So funny. At the same second you asked me this question, I saw a message come up on my screen from him. Um, wow. Matt, we met when we worked touring with the Reverend Horton Heat. He was uh, their keyboard player at the time. And so we've stayed in touch with him. Now he's the keyboard player for uh, Lee Rocker of the Stray Cats. So Matt lives in Virginia. Um, so he did his tracks virtually and sent them to us. But he is just such a monster player and a really nice guy. Yeah, sounds incredible on there too. So, And you also got some saxophone on this uh, new release as well. How did you uh, come about and, and incorporate some of the saxophone on here? So the sax, um, we've had the same player on all three of our albums. It's an old friend of, Matt, of my husband's in Hayden Cummings. He's, um, he's like most notably known for his work with the Kings of Nothing, who I love. They're like, if you're unfamiliar, uh, kind of like a rhythm and blues punk rock band uh, that had like some, some fame and success, um, I know, especially in Europe. Um, and they're one of our favorite bands. So yeah, Hayden's great. And you know, it's just like, we, we love that, that 50s and 60s rhythm and blues stuff. And a lot of that was very saxophone heavy. So we've tried to bring that in as much as we can on, on the appropriate songs. Yeah, great new release. It's fantastic. And in your back catalog, you got some great stuff there too. Uh, the track I stumbled on, Love You to Life. And what a, what a fun video. What's the story behind that video? You have a, you have a very uh, good video director that you have seem to keep using as well. I think his name is Emily. Um, we actually have a few different people we've worked with for music videos. We are really fortunate to just have a handful of friends that are great videographers. Um, Emily, she is our, my old roommate. She, uh, she left me to join Cirque du Soleil. She literally ran off to join the circus. So that's where she is now performing there in Orlando. Um, and she helped, um, direct our, our first two videos, which was actually not the Love You to Life one, but she did the Whiskey Pick one and the I Am The One video. And then our friend Greg Canan, he did the Love You to Life video. And he also did an earlier video when my band was Lara Hope and the Champ Tones. We did a fun one at a bowling alley. Um, so Greg did those. And we actually just filmed a, a new video for Let's Go for this album oh, cool. that I think should be coming out any day now. Oh, nice. I bet that's going to be a lot of fun. No question. That about was really that. fun. That's the most, this one is like the most work we've ever put into a video. All the other ones were takes that took like one day. This one took us, I think, three or four different days to get all the scenes. Yeah, they are a lot of fun. And sometimes it's more fun to do it like more impromptu, but I'm sure this one's going to pay off handsomely. It's probably going to look really good. It's really amazing. but whiskey like, pick. I love making music videos. Yeah, yeah. What's the story behind the rabbit and whiskey pick? <laughs> just uh, hilarity and craziness. There's, there's no nothing <laughs> no. really, uh, nothing deep behind it. Just a, a fun, a fun thing. Yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah, definitely. You know, like a lot of singer songwriters are just like uh, have to do videos. I mean, I have to go on top of that. But you seem to have a lot of fun with that. 
oh, music videos are the best. It's why we have so many. And I'd like to make a few more for this album. I, I just love it. I think it's such a good calling card for a band. You can really see what they're about. Like, know what you're getting yourself into. If you're you know, going to go see a band live, check out their video. Um, and we've had just so much fun. All of our video shoots have been a big party with our friends for the most part. Um, yeah, and I, I hope to do making, yeah, making more videos and that in that whiskey pick video, those are the actual, our local policemen, those weren't costumes. I had to talk to the mayor and get permission and these cops volunteered and came and like chased us around the brewery. But yeah, those are the real police. That's so cool. That really is. That's really, really neat. So when you're putting together an album, I mean, what is your, your inspiration for uh, putting together songs? Is, is it, you know, lyrics first, music, you hear a melody? How does that work for you when you're uh, crafting a song? I almost always am a lyrics first person. Um, I, I just, I have this folder in my cell phone where I keep um, just a running list of any song ideas, whether that's a, a, a specific lyrical line or just a concept for a song. Even if I'm driving, I'll speak it into my phone. Like as soon as I think of something, I write it down and then Sort of when I'm just feeling like inspired, I have some free time or I just, you know, the, the creative spirit is, is flowing through me or whatever. Um, I'll kind of refer to that list and think like, all right, well, which one of these topics kind of um, speaks to me the way I'm feeling right now? And I mean, I have song ideas are never my problem. I have tons of topic ideas. Uh, you know, some, it's the music that, you know, is what I need to sit down and and that, that usually comes after the concept and the lyrics. Do you co-write with your husband or is he, you basically just come to him with the, the, the music ideas and the lyrics and then he'll work it out with the bass? Yeah, and, and mostly that. I'll, I'll mostly come to him and there are definitely, you know, times where he's like, this is great, let's work with this. And then there are other times where he'll say, you know, this part needs some work, why don't we try this here? So, you know, it's definitely a collaborative effort, but a lot of times I'll come with at least like a, a skeleton of, of a song and an arrangement and lyrics. Um, but whenever he does have, have an idea, like something to throw in, even if it's small, they're usually like really gems of ideas that really make the song a lot better. It's a great collaboration. That's a, it's great. You found somebody in the music industry. You, you, you get each other, you know, it's, it's like, you know, like, oh, I'm always on the road. And then somebody is always at home saying, Hey, where are you? It's, it's really nice that you are together. Uh, do you do things that you need to do to kind of like have your own time, your me time? I mean, we should more, you know, this, this year was different because there was no music industry. So we really just kind of hung out, you know, with the exception of that, that album and doing our live streams, but still it was a lot more mellow than usual. But I mean, yeah, like we, we try to take walks and hang with our dogs and go to the beach when we can. But to be honest, it is really hard to separate it. It is like, uh, it's, it, this is something we talk to our therapist about, you know, like <laughs> I think any couple that works and yeah. plays together, like it just gets intermingled. And, you know, I've heard like, well, after 7 p.m., you should stop talking about the band and stop answering your emails. But that's easier said than done. It's like, it's my life and it's so intertwined. Yeah, that that's tough. It's easy for a therapist to sit there and say that. And say, oh yeah, just simply schedule your time. It's like, how could you do that when you know it? When inspiration just comes to you, hey, I'm driving. I I gotta get this down. I mean, it's the arts, and I think that that's that's difficult. I'm sure. And it's also it's the business of the art. I mean, like you know, we manage the band ourselves, so it's not just. I wish it was just the writing and the recording but it's a lot of the booking and the promotion and the graphic design and everything else that comes with that you know like i do tons of administrative work um even in terms of when people place an order from our website we don't have a warehouse or a record label shipping them out for us like if someone places an order then we have to package it up and go bring it to the post office and mail it out yeah, you got to do everything. You don't have that kind of a budget. You're not a big record company. You don't have that. So it's like, you know, people don't understand how much work there is that, that goes into a lot of this kind of stuff. I'm sure it's tough. 
it's a full it's a full time job. And don't get me wrong, like it's it's as much as it's annoying to have to do so much. It is also nice to be the person that's actually in control of everything. And if something needs to happen, I know that it will get done. Or if it doesn't get done, I only have myself or Matt to blame. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you don't have to manage a whole crew. It's that's you don't worry about that. So yeah, but it's a labor of love, I'm sure. It's like as exhausting as it could be. You you love doing it. So that's. Of course. And there's, you know, there's something to say for working hard for your own goals and to, you know, reach your own ends, uh, you know, as opposed to working hard to put money in someone else's pocket. So um, touring and doing the live shows, what's on the agenda going this far where we're more than halfway through 2021? Uh, what do you have on the plate as far as live performances go? <laughs> We're like, we're, we're pretty booked. I mean, I'm, I'm turning down shows at this point, but there's no, um, you know, official tour where we're just getting in the van and traveling across the country for days or weeks on end. It's just a lot of like local stuff, some regional stuff, and then a few fly-ins. Like we'll be going out to Vegas for the Viva Las Vegas Rockabilly Festival in September. We'll be flying down to um, Florida in February for another festival. And then everything else is mostly like New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Ohio, upstate, you know, upstate New York farther. Um, but there's a lot of those. And uh, at this point, I'm kind of waiting to book a, a quote unquote, like tour until there's a really good opportunity. I'm not itching to just jump in the van unless uh, I know it's like safe, places are reopened, and we have like a really good reason to go back out there. Very, very cool. It's it's very exciting. So how is it with the band? Are you doing a lot of rehearsal? How does that work, uh, getting prepped for these shows? So we've been doing a live stream every single Monday since March of 2020. Um, so uh, in, in the very beginning, it was just Matt and I as a duo when people, you know, weren't seeing each other. But then um, for the past, like, quite a while, we've been doing them as a trio. So at least me, Matt, and our guitar player, um, we've never stopped playing together. So we've been getting together at least once a week and rehearsing and gigging, um, gigging virtually. Um, and it's just really recently we've started to bring our drummer back into the mix and just started rehearsing again with him. So, you know, we were, did some rehearsals to lead up to our album release party, which was Saturday. And um, last weekend kind of really kicked off the season of more full band shows. So now we're going to get in the habit of getting back into rehearsals. We were just working on a, excuse me, on a new song after our live stream on Monday night. In terms of that, we're just getting back into the swings of, swing of things now um, as far as rehearsals and working on newer material. So how long have you had the current uh, band lineup? How did you all get together? Um, so, so Matt and I have been doing this from the beginning of the Arc Tones for, you know, for nine years. Um, Eddie, our guitar player, we've had, I think, three guitar players in the past nine years. Um, Eddie was the first and only person I just put an ad out on the internet on like Facebook, I believe, and just said, we're looking for a guitar player. Uh, everything else has, had always happened kind of organically of friends of friends and stuff like that. Um, but this one, we just put our feelers out and I, you know, someone that knew me that also knew Eddie's father or something like that, um, you know, saw our post and put him in touch with us. And he was a stranger and reached out. And now that was four years ago. So um, he came to that rehearsal and he could play our songs note for note perfectly. Mm. Um, and Eddie, like at the time was working in a music store, giving guitar lessons. Like he's just a phenomenal guitar player and a quick learner. So that's how Eddie joined. And then, um, a few years ago, we were looking for another drummer. Um, our, our last drummer just it was, wasn't working out at the time. And Jeremy is someone that I've known for a really long time, probably for 10 or 15 years. We've just been acquaintances. Um, always were really happy when we bumped into each other at the bar or at a show. Jeremy's always played in a lot of bands. And so when I was just kind of racking my brain, who are drummers that are good that might be available, I reached out to him and he was, um, you know, now that I think about it, I think I had actually reached out to him a few years prior and he, you know, his circumstances at the time just didn't allow him to go on tour. And I, I 
I, on a whim, tried him again. And at that point, he had a different job. He was in a different relationship. And he was like, let's do it. And he came on right before we went on the national tour with Brian Setzer. And um, that was that was three years ago. Oh, Brian Setzer, just an amazing talent. I'll never forget when that they first broke out on the scene in the 80s. It's like people doing period pieces in the 80s and very few were able to really carry that up. But they really stood out because it was really, really tough back then with all the, you know, and then later on the big hair bands in the latter half of the decade. But they, you know, that, that whole rockabilly thing just really, it's amazing how that worked. I'm sure that, that you probably had to feel that way back in those days as well. Yeah, Brian, you know, he, he, I don't want to say he got lucky because he really deserves all of his success, but you know, he did it at the right time. I know he had a hard time in the States in the beginning breaking out and he really had to go to the UK for the stray cats to really get the fame. And then it happened in the United States afterwards. But, um, you know, I guess he, he kind of kicked off that rockabilly revival, which, um, I'd like to think is still alive and well. <laughs> <laughs> I think he is. Gosh, beautiful hair. <laughs> How did he pull that off? Yeah, I mean, incredible, incredible talent. How did Matt uh, get that nickname? He's also known as The Knife. Oh, yeah. It's just kind of a play on words from Mac the Knife. Matt. Oh, okay. Matt the Knife. <laughs> yeah. He also is a barber. Ah. Does some straight straight razor shaves. Not he, he he's not doing that right now, but he is licensed. And when we first met, he was barbering full time in New York City. Great to fall back on, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Well, wow, that's amazing. So growing up, uh, you seem to like some punk too in the Hudson Valley. Was that uh, kind of a thing that was kind of going on as you were growing up? Um. Well. I, because I, I played in, in a punk band for 10 years, um, it, it, it overlapped with the arc tones. I mean, I played with them until maybe five years ago. Um, we were a, a power trio called Tiger Piss, and I played electric bass and sang. And we also did a lot of touring and released four albums of original material. Um, so yeah, that was really fun and, and like definitely fit a time in my life. And I, I'm sure we'll do a reunion again at some point. But um, that was, you know, that was a great, really, really fun thing. And I, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be here now doing this if it wasn't for starting out doing that. Oh, totally. Yeah. Punk is so fun. It's just, you know, sometimes you just need to get that out and get that energy out. So you know, I'm sure that, and I'm sure the audience is just sure. like totally heat that totally. up. <laughs> yeah. Completely. Well, it's been great speaking with you here yeah. to tell I mean, the tale. Really, it was great. And, and... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's... Um, um, I don't even remember what I was going to say. <laughs> well, it's been fantastic speaking with you. The uh, Here to Tell the Tale. Where can we get the uh, the album? Uh, physical copies and digital. All of the above um, at our website, which is larahope.net, L-A-R-A-H-O-P-E.net. And um, in the next month or two, we'll also have vinyl coming in from Germany. It's just taking a while to get here. Cool. You, you, do you get somebody separate to do the artwork as well? In the past, Matt has done a lot of our artwork. Um, but this release, um, the, we worked with a, a label out of Nebraska called Sower Records. And Mike, the label owner, he did the artwork for the front cover. And then Matt kind of um, used that image and, and uh, made, made uh, the back cover, you know, kind of to match that. And then our friend Fred, who started to do a lot of our graphics in the past couple of years, he did the disc art with the, with the kind of Day of the Dead skeleton artwork. Yeah, it really so it's a collaboration out. of artists. Yeah, it's really, yeah, and that really stands out and it makes all the difference and gets people to really get in there and get inspired as well. That makes me happy. Thank you. Well, take care and best of luck on the road and future recordings. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear much more from all of you in the near future. Thank you very much. Have a great night. You too. Bye-bye.